Just as we transition towards the sermon, let me read from God's word. Uh, The passage today is found in John chapter 5, starting at verse 30. And this section of scripture is entitled, Witnesses to Jesus. I can do nothing on my own. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just, because I seek not my own will, but the will of him who sent me. If I alone bear witness about myself, my testimony is not true. There is another who bears witness about me, and I know that the testimony that he bears about me is true. You sent to John, and he has borne witness to the truth. Not that the testimony that I receive is from man, but I say these things so that you may be saved. He was a burning and shining lamp, and you were willing to rejoice for a while in his light. But the testimony that I have is greater than that of John. For the works that the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I am doing, bear witness about me that the Father has sent me. And the Father who has sent me has himself borne witness about me. His voice you have never heard, his form you have never seen, and you do not have his word abiding in you, for you do not believe the one whom he has sent. You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, and it is they that bear witness about me, yet you refuse to come to me that you may have life. I do not receive glory from people, but I know that you do not have the love of God within you. I have come in my Father's name and you do not receive me, If another comes in his own name, you will receive him. How can you believe when you receive glory from one another and do not seek the glory that comes from the only God? Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one who accuses you, Moses, on whom you have set your hope. For if you believe Moses, you will believe me, for he wrote of me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? Let me pray for us just before the sermon. Lord, we just thank you that you're in control. Lord, we thank you that you are a sure and steady foundation amongst all the chaos that's going on at the minute. Lord, we thank you that you've given us your word and that your word is true. Lord, we thank you that your word speaks of Jesus and gives us the perfect and true picture of who he is. Lord, I pray during this time that you will help the people of God to become more and more like Jesus. May we be people who um, are very, very serious about your word, about what it says and about what it calls for us to be as Christians and calls for us to live um, at this time and at any time. Lord, the world world needs hope. Um, And you have given us the job of being your ambassadors to bring that hope to the world. Lord, will you help us by your spirit, empower us by your spirit to be uh, people who can bring the kingdom very, very near during this time. Lord, we pray for uh, the situation in this world as well. Lord, we pray for the virus and um, we don't pray for the virus. We pray about the circumstances around the virus, Lord, that you will um, intervene. Lord, we know that nothing that is happening in this world is outside of your control. Lord, you have purposes in it. Lord, but we thank you that there is hope that this um, pandemic may well come to a close soon with with vaccines coming on board lord may they be rolled out quickly to save lives but ultimately lord may we be a people who put our hope in you and not in scientists and not in vaccines lord that as long as this goes on lord that we recognize that you are building your kingdom building your church and and, and nothing no virus and no means of man is going to stop that Lord, we pray for those that have been affected, those that have been affected through through death, through this, Lord, we pray for them, um, that you'll be a comfort to them. Lord, we pray for uh, the kids um, who were expecting to do exams at this time and their world has been thrown upside down. Lord, that will you be near to them? Uh, will you help them uh, to digest what's going on? Lord, may you um, just ensure that their education is not um, affected unduly by this. Lord, we know that you're the only one who can pull this all back together. And we know ultimately that you're weaving this all together for your purposes. Um, so so please help with that. Uh, Lord, I just pray for America as well at the minute. Uh, amongst all the international things that are going on, um, that you will bring reconciliation to that nation and heal that nation. Lord, may your people across the world, not just in America, um, may they pray and in their praying may that nation be healed. 
again, just believing what you said in the Bible to be true. Lord, just bless our time together now. Um, may the words that are spoken be from heaven. And Lord, may they by the Spirit pierce our hearts and change us. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hello hey everyone, uh, welcome to our online recording of our gathering today. You are welcome with us, I just want to say that, you are welcome to join with us as we go through uh, a portion of God's Word today. And what we're going to do today is really uh, what we, uh, the, the schedule for the year always starts out the same. And what we want to do today is go uh, begin our, our four week series in our core values as a church. What we want to do is every January, uh, what we want to do is reset ourselves as a church, just remind ourselves of, of what's really important to us. And so how, we're, how we do this is that so we go through our core values. Uh, in Cornerstone Church, we have four core values. Uh, I wonder if you're part of the family of Cornerstone Church, do you know what those core values are? Uh, I asked a few people in the in the lead up to this this week just what they knew of the core values and to be honest some of them didn't exactly know what the core values were and so that's why that's part of the reason why we need to do this short four week series at the beginning of January just to reset ourselves uh, to what is really important to us as a church. You see, core values are the things that we believe to be most important to us. They are the things that we believe that are most important to the way that we live and the way that we work as a church. Core values should determine our priorities as a church. Um, and what I want to say today, as I say every time we do this, is that there's a massive difference between aspired values and realized values. Aspired values are, are, are things that we want to be, things that we... Uh, desire to be things that we desire to see happen in the next year or in the next two years, whatever that is. Those are things that we, we see out there that we want to be. Uh, realized values are what we are. Uh, and so it's really important for us as a church, as Cornerstone Church, as we think through these things, is always to have in our minds, is this our reality now? Is this what we are? And so when we look at our core values, uh, I'll outline them in a second, Let's have that question in our minds. Is this who we are now? Do we see these things in the life of Cornerstone Church? Um, if we don't, then we need to keep pushing towards them. And if we do, we need to celebrate them and we need to encourage them more. And so let's just go and, and let's just go through the four core values that we have as Cornerstone Church. First of all, Today we're going to be looking at it. We are Jesus-centered as a church. Second, we are radically generous as a church. Third, we are a church of disciples making disciples. And fourth and finally, we are a church of kingdom carriers. And I don't want to get into the rest of them too much today because we're, we're going to be going through them in the weeks ahead. But the ones we're going to be looking at today is Jesus-centered and so what does that mean? What does that mean to be Jesus-centered? Now you might think, and even as I, as I say that phrase, Jesus-centered church, you might think that is the most obvious thing in the world. Well, unfortunately, that's not the case. And so that's why we need to state it. There are churches who aren't Jesus-centered, and so what we want to do as Cornerstone Church is put it out there that that's what we gather around. That's who we gather around. We are a Jesus-centered church. And what we're going to do today is slightly different than what we normally do in the fact that we're not be, we'll not be exegeting a text today. We'll not be breaking down a scripture today and going through it. But, and that'll be the same for the next four weeks. But what we want to do is these are really important things for us to grasp as a church. And in the, in the slim, simplest terms, grasp them. The, the more simple we can make these things, the, the easier they will be to, for us to remember and to live out. And so that's what we're going to be doing today. But what I do want to do today is start in, in, in the reading that was read in John chapter 5. And then I want to explain the three distinct ways in which we as Cornerstone Church desire to be Jesus-centered. 
And what we have in John 5 uh, is Jesus here is involved in a lengthy discussion with the Pharisees, uh, the religious leaders, about who he was and about the authority that he has and about what he came to do. Earlier in the chapter, Jesus has just healed a man who has probably been an invalid all his life. Like miraculously healed him. And you would imagine that everyone would be happy about this. You Here's a guy who has lived in, in probably pain all his life, has lived in shame all his life to a certain degree. And he's healed. He's made well. And you would think that everyone would be delighted to see that. Not so. The Pharisees weren't delighted to see that at all. And they accused Jesus of many things because of this. The Pharisees had a major problem with Jesus. And one of the commentaries that I, I read around John 5 tells me possibly why they had a problem with Jesus. Listen to this. When Jesus went to Jerusalem, he did not spend his time in elite hotels. Nor did he concentrate his ministry merely in the temple or give attention to the rich and the famous who could help him politically and financially with his ministry. He concentrated on the people in need, which for the elite society was part of his problem. You see, what ticked the establishment off most about Jesus was who he spent his time with, who Jesus associated with. Well, the second part of their problem was that Jesus didn't necessarily abide by the rules that they had created, that they had made. You see, the Jews in this story were not interested in the well-being of the people, but merely in them keeping the religious rules and traditions. See, what happened was that the, the, the Pharisees had added to the law, they had added to the law that God had given, and, and, and whilst the Pharisees sometimes can get a hard time for this. Their intent behind this was probably good, but nevertheless, they added to the laws that God had given. And they had added a load of qualifications given to the law. And they had added to what it meant to abide by the Sabbath. You see it in Exodus 31, and we'll be going back into Exodus uh, after we're finished this series. But let, let me read to you from Exodus 31. And the Lord said to Moses, You are to speak to the people of Israel and say, Above all, you shall keep my Sabbath, for this is a sign between me and you throughout all your generations, that you may know that I, the Lord, sanctify you. You shall keep the Sabbath, because it is holy for you. Everyone who profanes it shall be put to death. Whoever does any work on it, th that soul shall be cut off from among his people. Six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of solemn rest, holy to the Lord. Whoever does any work on it shall be put to death. And therefore the people of Israel shall keep the Sabbath, observing the Sabbath throughout their generations as a covenant forever. It is a sign forever between me and the people of Israel that six days the Lord made heaven and earth, and on the seventh day he rested and was refreshed. That's Exodus 31, 12 to 17. And so what the Pharisees had done on top of that was add a list of do's and don'ts. They had added a list of extra requirements that, that qualified what you were allowed to do and what you weren't allowed to do. But it wasn't God's law. It wasn't God's law. And you see, when Jesus healed this man, on the Sabbath, they deemed him to be breaking the law. And he wasn't. He wasn't. And just as a side note, before we get into the main point of what I want to say about this part of the text, is that we need to be very careful in the church and in Christianity in general, not to put extra rules and regulations that God hasn't given us. Not to put extra requirements on people that God hasn't given us. We'll talk about one of the ways we are Jesus-centered in a minute, being, being Jesus-centered in word. And so we need to be really careful that we just stick 
to the word, not adding to it, not taking away from it, but sticking to it. You see, one of the main points of this text today, and Jesus spells it out in verse 39, he says this to the Pharisees, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life. But it's there that bear witness about me. John 5, 39. The Pharisees, they missed the wood for the trees. You know that phrase. It's a, it's a very well-known phrase. But because they were so interested in the, in the minutiae, in, in the small detail, in the adding on of, of rules and regulations, they missed the big picture. And what Jesus is saying to the Pharisees here is that you're so caught up in trying to figure all this out that you missed me. You missed me. And you see, what we don't want to do as a church is get so caught up in rules and regulations that we miss Jesus. We miss the big picture. And so we want to be a Jesus-centered church. We want him to be in the middle of everything we do. In the evangelical world, world today, you'll hear the phrase gospel-centered quite a lot. And, and that's a good phrase. It's a, it's a right phrase. And, and what people mean by when they say gospel-centered, they mean, they actually mean Jesus-centered. They mean that the gospel is the story of Jesus. But we want it to be a little bit more explicit than that. And so that's why we went with Jesus-centered. The good news is the good news about a person and that person is Jesus. And so everything must revolve around him. But in being specific about that, we want to tease out what that means for us as a church. Because it's very easy to say something, it's very easy to make a statement, but not actually know what it means. I watched a, a little clip on uh, Twitter the other day it was uh, of someone mocking a modern day podcast and it went on for like two or three minutes just speaking but the person actually said nothing and there's quite a lot of life like that at the moment where a lot of people are speaking but saying nothing and so when we say Jesus centered we need to know what that means we need to know specifically what we are saying. And so we've broken it down into three parts so that we can know. And the first thing we want to be is Jesus centered in word. Jesus centered in word. Around Cornerstone, we take the Bible extremely seriously. It is the word of God. We take it as our sole authority. It is inerrant and infallible in every single way. But we don't want to make the same mistake that the Pharisees made. Jesus says you search the scriptures because in them themselves you thought you would find life. But, but they do something. They point away from themselves to me. They show you from beginning to end me. These men who doubted and accused Jesus of breaking the Sabbath, of breaking the law. These were men who had devoted themselves to learning the scriptures, mastering the Old Testament, both in, in, in practice and in content. And as I said, they, they even invented all these rules around it. They knew it so well. And yet here we have Jesus saying that all of their study, all of their pouring over the scriptures, actually had distracted them from the main point, the main point being him. He declares that the scriptures point to him. And unfortunately, his listeners couldn't stomach the thought of the Messiah coming as a mere mortal, humble man that Jesus was. Jesus elaborates on this. He says, Moses' words will stand in judgment over them because even Moses 
in giving the law and the commands was pointing forward to one who would keep them perfectly. And that one who would keep them perfectly would be Jesus. And so when we come to the word as Cornerstone Church, and when I say that, I just don't mean me. I don't mean me as the, the elder who is, who is responsible for teaching. I don't mean me just being Jesus-centered when I come to the Word. I mean us being Jesus-centered when we come to the Word. When we come to the Word to read it, to pray over it, what we want to do and what I want to point you to do is to do it in such a way that you look for Jesus in it. You know, there's... I say this all the time too, but the little the little story, the little tagline that's over the, the, the Jesus Storybook Bible. Every story whispers his name. And it does. It's so true that every scripture that we read points to Jesus. And you see, this Christ-centered, Jesus-centered way of reading scripture, of studying scripture, of pouring over the scriptures, has massive implications on, on our discipleship, our mission as Christians, everything that we do. You see, if we don't read this, if we don't read the scriptures like this, it can very easily become a, a moralistic a do, list of do's and don'ts, or it can become a, a, a just a book of good stories with, with good characters involved. You know, it becomes the stories of do's and don'ts and, and heroes and villains, good guys and, and bad guys, winners and losers, good stories. And that's not what scripture is. Scripture is a book about a person who brings good news. Jesus didn't come to give us good advice. Jesus came to tell us the good news of the gospel. And Jesus came to tell us the good news of the gospel is this. That we as sinners who deserve the wrath of God can be saved from that wrath by trusting in what he did through his death and resurrection. That's the good news of the Bible. The good news of all of scripture points towards Jesus and what he did for us on the cross. And therefore the Bible, the Bible's purpose is not to give us a, a, a bunch of wonderful stories about heroes and villains, good guys and bad guys. No, nope. the Bible is there to point us to one person and one person alone and that person is Jesus Christ. So as we begin this new year, and as we begin this new year as a church, I want to ask us again, how do you read the scriptures? How do you study the scriptures? Is it in a way that looks for Jesus? Is it in a way that looks for his story in every story? I pray that it is, and I pray that we'll get better at this. I want us to get better at this. I want us to read the Bible. I want to read the Bible in such a way that we, we understand the big picture story. That's why we, in, in Advent, do that as well. We want the big picture to be seen. Not to get lost in the small details, but, but see the big picture of what God is doing through Jesus. It's so important. It's so important that we read the word, that we pray through the word, that we preach the word, that we study the word in a christ centered manner and so that's why we want to be jesus centered in word the second way we want to be jesus centered is in our worship and let me just unpack for a moment what i mean when i use the word worship and i know that that i am preaching to the choir to to a certain degree when i'm when i'm speaking of course on church about worship i know that that the majority of you certainly will know that worship is not just singing on a Sunday. I know that. But we need to have a clear definition of what worship is so that we can hang our hat on that, as it were. And 
the best definition of worship that I've I've heard recently comes from a, a church in Austin, Texas, and it comes from the Austin Stone Church, and it says this: Biblical worship, and you'll you'll know this quote when when you hear it because I've used it before. Biblical worship is the full life response, head, heart, and hands, to who God is and what He has done. That is, even just saying that quote, I am again taken back by the the bigness of it, of what worship actually is. It's so much more than singing. It is a full life response, head, heart, hands, to who God is and what he has done. The reality is, as human beings, we're made to worship. We know this. I talk about this regularly. Uh, there is something innately inside us that is that is that is given to worship, and we want to ascribe greatness to something. We want something outside of ourselves to 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 worship, to to think is great, to 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 put our adoration on, to put our praise towards. And you see, in the perfection of creation, that's the way it was. Adam and Eve worshipped God. And part of the problem of the fall was that was distorted. When sin entered into the world, our worship was misdirected. And so let's just think through how we can, in some way, through the power of the Spirit, reclaim this worship, this Jesus-centered worship in our lives. So if worship is a full life response head, heart, hands, let's just take those things and break them down and see what we find. When we think head, we usually understand that as to be our our thinking. Yes, you would agree. And we think hearts, we usually think that's the way that we feel. So head is thinking, heart is uh, feeling. And then when we think of our hands, we think that's action. And those are really good just ways to break that down. That's that's perfectly fine. But what we can tend to do, and I think this is, is, is where we get a little bit off on this one, is to think is to is to split individuals into those categories. What we do is we, we split a person who's a thinker and we just put them in that category and we say well, that's that's what they do. That they they're thinkers, they are so those would be the theological minded amongst us. Those would be the, the ones who know scripture well. Those who the, the ones who would uh, study scriptures and, and they're the thinkers. They're the theologians amongst us. And then we have the ones who are the heart people. They're the f- feelers. I don't mean that literally. Uh, a few of them about Cornerstone Church. But uh, they're the ones who, who they just feel everything. Uh, and, it, and they're all about the feelings and they're all about how people feel and, and they're all uh, yeah uh, and then there are the, the the hands people the action people they're the doers they, they get stuff done and, and uh, they're the ones who stack chairs they're the ones who serve they're the ones who uh, welcome they're the ones who do the tea they're the, those, those are the doers and so we have three categories of people we have the theologians over in the corner and they're just all around in a wee circle studying the Bible. Then we have the feelers who, who are all in a, in a group hug over here. And, and then we have uh, the action people who are looking at the other two groups thinking, what the flip are they doing? But uh, they're the ones who are getting, the, they're putting the church away and they're doing the stuff. And what we tend to do is segregate those three, pe- those three types of people. But that's not the way our worship should be. This definition of worship says that our this is an an all life response, head, heart, and hands to what God has done and who he is. You see, King David was 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 a person who had many faults, who was flawed in many, many ways. But he seemed to get this head, heart, hands thing right to a certain degree. Let me read to you from Psalm 1. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he meditates day and night. His delight was in the law. Now, 
you can see two things, two aspects of the of the head and the heart there already. His delight, his feelings, his his just his joy was what? In the law. His head, his thinking. He meditated on, on this day and night. And you see then, out of those two things, he acted. This was someone who got this right. He delighted, his, his, he loved the law and he studied it and he thought about it and he meditated on it and then he acted out of it. Sometimes he fell and he acted wrongly, but the most of the time he didn't. You see, worship must be holistic. It cannot be just what we do on a Sunday. And as I say, you know this. And so when we talk about Jesus-centered worship, we're not simply talking about the songs that we sing being Jesus-centered, although that is important. We're talking about thinking about Jesus. We're talking about loving Jesus with our feelings and our emotions. And we're talking about serving Jesus with our hands. Question for us all when we think about that definition of what worship is. And we think about head, heart, hands. Let's just think through that for a moment. Head. Are you studying the scriptures? We're in a new year and how are you getting on with that new, uh, I'll read the Bible in a year plan. Have you fallen already or are you keeping going? Uh, I, I didn't even try one this year. I'm not going to not gonna lie. Uh, but are we studying the scriptures? We should be. Are we getting to know Jesus through his word? We should be. Heart. How emotionally attached are you to Jesus? Do you love Jesus? When you think about Jesus and when you study his word, does that lead to any emotion in you? When you think about the cross, when you think about his life, when you think about what he has done and what he has accomplished for you, does it make you joyful? Does it make you celebrate in yourself the gospel? And then out of those two things, do, do they make you serve? Do they inspire service? Do they motivate service? We want to be Jesus-centered in our worship. We want to be Jesus-centered in our word. We want to preach the Bible in, in a Jesus-centered way. We want to study the Bible in a Jesus-centered way. We want to uh, pray over the scripture in a Jesus-centered way. We want to offer the Bible to others in a Jesus-centered way, but we want to worship in a Jesus-centered way. Head, heart, hands. And so please, when we think about our worship, as I say, I know I'm preaching to the choir, but let's not just think music. Let's not just think songs. Let's think worship sitting down with the scriptures and reading about Jesus or listening to the scriptures and thinking about Jesus. Let's think worship is our response in and of ourselves, in our hearts to Jesus and what he has done and what he's accomplished. Let's think about our, our service as acts of worship. Let's worship in a Jesus-centered way. Finally, the third way that we want to be Jesus-centered is we wanna be Jesus-centered in our witness. The message that we proclaim is simple. It's not complicated. It's a friend of mine always used to say that football was a, a simple game complicated by fools. Uh, and so is witness. It is a simple game complicated by fools. We have one message, one message only, and that is Jesus. It can't be anything else. And again, you might say, oh, well, John, that's all right. That kept it obvious again. You're, you're saying that because, well, that's what it should be. And, and yes, that's what it should be. The message that we give should be Jesus. But is it? But is it? 
Is it okay for us to assume that it is? No, it's not. Is it okay for us just to think, well, you know, back when Cornerstone began six years ago, we knew that the church was planted for a particular reason, and that particular reason was to reach the lost and, and, and to disciple people in Christ. Can we just assume that that's the same now? No, we can't. We cannot assume that it is the same as it was then because mission drift happens. It's a real thing. And so the message must be Jesus in a world that is messed up, in a world that is scared, in a world that is frightened, in a world that is clinging and looking for hope in every single area. We have a message of one who came into the world, of a God who came out of the world and gave himself for us. It is the ultimate message of hope. And he's our only message. He's our only message. We fall into a couple of traps when we think about the message that we preach and the message that we proclaim. One is this, and as a church, we need to think about this. And never more so than now. Never more so than now. So, so these words are, 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 I think, very relevant to what we're doing. One of, the, one of the pitfalls that we fall into when it comes to we want to be Jesus-centered in, in witness and in our proclamation of the gospel is that we think that by simply bringing people into church, that is enough. What happens when that has been taken away? Like it is now. I sit here today recording this on, on Friday before Sunday, uh, having made the decision again with our elders last night that we weren't going to gather again for a few weeks. And trust me, there is nothing that breaks my heart more than that. Uh, but if we're depending on bringing people to a building so that someone can proclaim the gospel to them and they get saved, we are missing the point of the Great Commission. The Great Commission for the disciples was to go into all the world and what? Proclaim the gospel to all the disciples. And so really what I want to say to us is don't fall into the pitfall of thinking that by simply bringing people to a meeting, that that is enough. That is what we're called to do. It's not what we're called to do. The, what, we're, what we've been called to do is take the message out of the building to the people. And so that means that where you go to work on Monday, the people who you rub shoulders with at the school gate, the people who you play sport with, the people that you are with most of the time, those are the people wh where you are that you need to be sharing the gospel with. Let's not fall into that pitfall. The second pitfall, and again, this is never has has never been more relevant. The second pitfall we can fall into is thinking that simply by being good neighbors, we will draw people to Christ. And we will win people to Christ. The reality is we can be the best neighbours that a neighbour has ever been to a neighbour. And if we never tell that neighbour about Jesus, why on earth would we think that they would come to Christ? The message is a message to be proclaimed. We need to tell people about Jesus. The good news is news. News is proclaimed. It is spoken. And we need to speak this message. 
Like some of the things that we've done over Christmas have been fantastic. The, the hamper idea was, was brilliant. It worked really well. Uh, it has been, been great. But are we following that up with genuine gospel conversations? I know I'm challenged by that myself as I think about what we did. In the new lockdown situation that we're in, are we reaching out and being good neighbours? As we should be. We should be good neighbours. Are we reaching out to see if everyone's okay and around us? But are we telling our neighbours about Jesus? The good news is news to be proclaimed. And so, to round this up today, and as we look forward to 2021, uh, looking forward being a very, very optimistic term, are we Jesus-centred? As a church, as Cornerstone Church, can we reflect on 2020, the year that was, and think, are we Jesus-centred? Are we Jesus-centred in the way that we've read, read Scripture, the way that we've poured over Scripture, the way that we've prayed it, or the, way, the way that we've delivered it? Or have we been Jesus-centred? Are, are we Jesus-centred in our worship, in our head and in our hearts and in our hands, the way, that we've, the way that we've thought about Jesus, the way that we've felt about Jesus and the way that we've served Jesus? Are we Jesus-centred? And are we Jesus-centred in our witness? the way that we have proclaimed the gospel with our mouths. My prayer for us as we enter 2021 is that we would again call ourselves back to being Jesus-centered. Let me pray for us. And let me pray that the Spirit would show us, convict us, lead us, in being Jesus-centred in the year ahead. Let me pray. Father, we thank you for your son. Uh, the ultimate goal of life is to glorify and honour him. And so help us to do that. Help us to do that through your spirit. Help us to do that as we think about you. Your word help us to do that as we think about the way that we worship you help us to do that the way that we think about telling others about jesus help us to honor him in everything that we do help us to love him in everything that we do help us lord we pray in jesus name his beautiful righteous holy perfect name we pray amen